So it's a real it's a real pleasure to be here. We uh, appreciate this opportunity to talk to such a distinguished group um, and uh, on the exposome and the, how our research is influencing this. So there you see a picture of our building, um, and this is the title of my talk. Uh, Yusha's introduced uh, me. Um, our laboratory is a highly interdisciplinary laboratory here in, in the Qualcomm Institute uh, with representatives from the School of Medicine, the School of Engineering, uh, School of Public Health across the way at San Diego State University, and of course a wonderful group of uh, PhD students and postdocs that make things happen. Uh, this is the way I like to depict uh, the type of research that we do. We, we do work in health and all the health-related sciences. We bring in technology to support what it is that we're doing, the different types of technologies from mobile devices to uh, wearable sensors to cloud computing to uh, different forms of data analytics. And then we do a lot of intervention research. So a lot of our work focuses on how to get these technologies to be used by individuals uh, in, in places where they, they live and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and in, in ways that hopefully allow uh, support their health. A very important thing, and you'll see this diagram a couple times in, this, in both my presentation and Jacqueline's, the thing that influences our research is a really very multifactorial approach to envisioning what contributes to health. It's a cells to society uh, approach. And what we try and focus on is essentially everything in this stack of data that you're talking about, that, that, that we'll talk about today. So again, I'm going to cover three projects, so the Health Data Exploration Project, the City Sense and MetaSense projects, and then a project where we're trying to pull the data together from the, the, these various levels in the stack. So what is the Health Data Exploration Project? This is a project funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and, and the subtitle is Personal Data for the Public Good. Um, and this is predicated on this, on this notion that the health happens where we live, learn, work, and play. The vast majority of things that influence our health are things outside of the traditional medical care system. And the ways that we've understood these influences on health have been through things like randomized controlled trials or uh, periodic population level surveys or electronic medical records uh, or, or the various biomarkers that we can use to determine what people might have been exposed to. Well, things are changing a lot. Uh, this notion of people being online all the time with various wearable devices and sensors, it's just amazing what's happened over the last decade. And it's, and it's going to continue to change. And I love this economist cover. You know, by the end of this decade, 80% of adults are going to have a supercomputer in their pocket. So this is just an extraordinary explosion of capability to measure and monitor things. And this is increasingly called the Internet of Things, or what, what, what Qualcomm our local big tech company calls the Internet of Everything. Essentially, everything is getting connected, and this also is just an extraordinary number of devices uh, generating uh, lots and lots of uh, traces, digital traces of everyday life, essentially pixelating a very rich picture of what people uh, are doing on a daily basis. So we have this increasingly diverse and expanding ecosystem of devices, apps, and services that are generating lots and lots of data. So then this ecosystem of data involves the individuals who are, who are producing it, the companies who are, who are largely collecting it and, and for, for obviously their own, their own commercial purposes. But then as researchers, as those of us who want to understand the exposome, we have an interest in getting at, the, at these data. But that's a non-trivial issue. And so quite, we, we have lots of questions about how can we use these data to improve health research. Uh, uh, there, there are new models of inquiry that... that uh, ethical issues with respect to accessing and using these data, privacy, informed consent, a variety of things. But can we use these data to address disparities, and can we use these data to address uh, this explosion of runaway costs uh, in, in healthcare? Lots and lots of issues uh, that, that, that come up, again, research methods, uh, what sorts of designs do we use, uh, what, how do we handle the scale of the data, what about the quality of these data, is, is it the, are the data representative of the things that we might want, that we might want to know? What about ownership of, ownership of the data? And again, privacy, ethics, informed consent, et cetera. So this is just one example of, of kind of the way we're, we're looking at this. It's this notion of the traditional research data that we might use in, in, a, in a clinical study compared to these new forms of personal data. Uh, the context of collection, everyday life, as opposed to the studies. Uh, these data are cheap rather than expensive, but they're, but they're often uh, and almost always unvalidated, especially at scale. And the specificity, comparability, completeness, uh, was informed consent uh, used to capture the, the data? Is it not? Again, when we do our traditional studies, these things are often very, very clear. So these comparisons of how we look at these data are, are really informing what we're doing as a project. And this project is building a network of researchers who are interested in, uh, in, in, 
the use of these data for research. Uh, we have 130 companies, researchers, and strategic partners. Uh, we're particularly interested in getting um, companies engaged in this because, uh, again, the companies who have these data um, uh, you know, are often, again, just using them for a single purpose. But imagine if we could bring bring data together from several companies and, and, and ask questions about what contributes to, again, quality of life in any particular community or any particular age group. And so we're, again, our project is moving forward with core research activities and, and activities across the network. Um, We've got a terrific group of advisors uh, on this now, ranging from um, up in the upper west coast there, Julie Keenst, who's a researcher in computer science at the University of Washington, to the quantified self folks in the Bay Area, all the way across the country to John Brownstein, who some of you I'm sure know, he might have even given one of your webinars, John, so the computational epidemiologist at Harvard, who's doing, uh, doing wonderful work on social networks and, and, um, and surveillance. Uh, Tanzim Chowdhury at Cornell Tech uh, is, a, a, again, another computer scientist doing some terrific work in, uh, in uh, affective uh, assessment uh, using uh, wearable technologies. And then patients like me, uh, the, the groups of, uh, of, of uh, people with similar diseases sharing information on what it is that, uh, that might contribute to either uh, their health or their illness. So our, our project has core activities, and we use this Venn fun, fun diagram to describe this where we're looking at essentially representativeness of the data, uh, exploring methods and metrics for how one might think about using personal health data in research, and then the utility and safety of this it is, it is how, how can we push the, the, uh, the envelope a bit further to, to understand, um, again, how we as researchers who are used to using traditional forms of data might use these new types of data. So an example of this, we're doing a systematic review right now of um, of the validity of wearable devices currently on the market, there's a surprising uh, paucity of information out there about just how valid these are uh, in terms of comparison of the data that they generate to uh, gold, what we would consider as gold standards in, in our world. But there is some data. So we're, we're in the middle of We've actually just completed this review right now, uh, reviewing everything that we can find, including the published literature, great, uh, gray literature, et cetera. And so, um, You'll be hearing more about this. We'll be posting the results of this on our on our website, as well as uh, we hope publishing in a, in, a, in a very strong journal. But but this is again something that's important if we're going to be thinking about using these devices. We also I mentioned we're funding these uh, a few agile projects. These are short pilot studies that uh, that are that involve researchers who are using this. And I'm giving you a couple of examples of what I thought you you folks might be interested in. Um, this is a project that Julie and Tanzim are doing uh, on, on um, passive sensing of circadian rhythms for models of cognitive performance. Can, how can we use some of these new forms of data to capture what happens to people over any given day and when are they likely to be uh, up and when are they likely to be having problems with their performance or their function? And then another really interesting study that, that um, uh, Rumi Chinara is doing with RunKeeper data is uh, looking again at population-level relationships between RunKeeper data. And RunKeeper has data on 27 million individuals, uh, lots and lots of data. And they're actually very proactive in terms of trying to explore uh, the implications of their data uh, in, in, with respect to, um, again, the health of their users. Uh, and so this is, a, again, I think an excellent example of you know, what we might be able to do with Fitbit data or with Jawbone data or others. Um, another thing we're doing is, is, this, is exploring this issue of data ownership. This always comes up. Technically, if any of you use these devices, when you sign the terms and conditions to use a wearable device, <coughs> you're, you're giving up the ownership of the data to the company that captures the data. But what does ownership really mean in terms of, of um, health-related data? Uh, is, is, is that actually a construct that's useful? And, and we had Barbara out at a meeting a, a few weeks ago talking about the fact that these types of data might be considered as a new natural resource, uh, as something that could, could actually be very helpful to all of us, to the, to the Commonwealth, if you will. So we're digging into this because there's surprisingly uh, little scholarly uh, um, uh, work in, in this area. <clears throat> so the next project I'm going to talk about is really is a, is a project we've been working on for the last few years called the CitySense. Um, uh, project, um, and I think some of you, I know David is, is just quite aware of this. So this is focusing on air quality monitoring, and um, in San Diego County, the current state of monitoring um, for 3.2 million residents and 4,000 square miles are 10 monitoring sites that are used, and these monitoring sites, if you go online right now, you can 
find your local air quality uh, district uh, information where you are. In, in our area, it puts up a map like this. And so these are not very specific maps with respect to this. So the vision for this project, this was funded by the National Science Foundation, was uh, participatory sensing uh, with individuals carrying around a device that would allow them to capture air quality and actually more than one individual. Imagine having a variety of individuals across the community who are sensing, contributing, and bringing the data up into uh, a cloud that could be used by others and on bad days uh, be used by public health researchers or, or uh, even clinicians or hobbyists, if hobbyists are interested in going online and getting an understanding of what's happening in, in their neighborhood or activists. And you'll hear a little bit about that in a, in a, in a moment or two. So on this project, we, we We've developed this platform uh, that, con that consists of a sensor, carbon monoxide, NO2, ozone, humidity, pressure, and temperature, which is essentially in real time on a mobile app can give you an air quality reading. Uh, that's uh, this mobile air quality reading. And you, and you, you can see you can, it can be shared. You can tweet it or, or share it with your friends on Facebook. Bringing these data up, getting a, drilling down, getting a bit more information on this, but importantly, bringing these data back up into a back-end server that allows tracking of the data, so, you, so the, the, the path of someone capturing these data over any given day, and the graph on the bottom is essentially the area under the curve of, of what they might have been exposed to as far as the aggregate air quality index. And so we conducted a, a, a study a, a couple of years ago with, uh, with uh, uh, commuters to UCSD, uh, people who uh, commuted via a variety of methods because we were very interested in uh, what they might have been exposed to, and commuting at least 20 minutes because we wanted to actually understand what they're exposed to. And this gives you an example of, of what we found. So what we found were a number of users in that black line across the bottom is actually the closest air quality monitoring station to UCSD. So that if you went to the air quality mo monitoring station and, and dialed in that particular uh, one, you would find the black line. And, and you could see what the various users were, in fact, um, exposed to quite a bit more on some occasions. Um, and so What's interesting with this is if you get, get these data and then begin to use methods of uh, interpolation and, and uh, um, uh, geostatistical kriging, which is one, what one of our machine learning folks did with this, you get a much, much more granular ability to understand, well, if your house or if your building is located in this particular area, this is what it is that, uh, that shows up, as opposed to a map that looks like this. And so we felt that this is very promising. We presented this at the Wireless Health uh, meeting, uh, again, a couple of years ago. One, they actually won the best paper, and, and we're, we're excited. But, but one of the problems with this is calibration. Uh, the the CitySense device was actually calibrated. I think we sent it back to your institute, as a matter of fact. There was an effort to calibrate, or was it EPA? It was one of the others. Either your group or EPA was doing this, the NIEHS. And so what we felt we wanted to do was to increase the ability to calibrate on the fly, if you will. So we now have a new CitySense grant called MetaSense, that we're calling MetaSense. And we brought in a new investigator, Mike Hannigan from uh, University of Colorado, who's sort of an expert on this notion of, of calibrating environmental sensors in the field. He's, he had not done this with these kinds of sensors, but he, we've added him to our CitySense team. And what we're trying to do are, is to take the sensors that we have available, and we've actually upgraded this, I'll, I'll comment on this in a, in, a, in a moment, and then the 10 monitoring sites that, that we've got in the local community and improve our ability to, to, uh, to calibrate these devices because we know that they get out of calibration. Even though we would calibrate them under the hood before they went to the, to the field, uh, we know that, that at some points in time they, they lost that calibration, and that's an issue. So can we... Can we use the software that's on the device? Can we use uh, software that's in the cloud or on, on, our, on our machines here at UCSD to improve this? And so this is a schematic that, that our research group has put together about the fact that we're, we're doing measurements and we've got noise. This noise has certain components that are related to various other factors, as, as we understand. This is mostly electro electrochemical sensing. Extracting this information from the noise and using that combined with other data that we might have, historical data, uh, from uh, previous readings from days like that to develop a model of what, um, of what the outputs should be on that particular day. So this depicts what we're doing in each year. We're developing, we're actually building a new board right now and developing the architecture for the system. Uh, this, the second year of the project is going to be very important because here's where we're going to be collecting lots of data. And, we, and we, one of our co-investigators, Sanjay Dasgupta, is a machine learning expert, 
who helped us with the first version of this. And so we're going to be learning from the data, essentially using machine learning approaches to understand what, what patterns might be, both through people using these devices and patterns in the background, collecting these data and then experimenting with the self-calibration, pollutant discovery, and ability to, again, fix things on the fly. And the, and the system actually supports this because we've got a replaceable sensor board. We're doing a, a much better board with the, when we first built this board almost five years ago. Uh, the, the technologies were only so good. Now we're building a better board to support iterative improvements of this with replaceable uh, new sensors. We're, we're also improving the software that's on the board to, to support the calibration algorithms that are necessary on the board. We have a replaceable communication module because uh, also the radios that we're using for this are, are improving over time. And then the CI, which is the cyber infrastructure, essentially the computational processes on this, are really distributed between the board, the phone, and the cloud. And so this notion of, of, of doing this in these three locations <clears throat> allows us to, among other things, improve the algorithms, but also, very importantly, uh, address battery-related issues you know, to optimize how, how quickly or frequently or not frequently, infrequently we, we can do any updating that we need to do because power is always the issue, especially with any any portable device. So we're actually really excited about this project, and and, and, um, and with luck we will have a much richer and a better system uh, to, to, to assess things. Uh, so again, this constant feed of data, creating a map of sensor readings, calibration performed by the phone in the field, um, and then uh, ultimately Im improving confidence. And importantly, these types of systems don't have to be used by a lot of people. They just need to be used by enough people distributed across the population to begin to get a better understanding of what's happening in that, in that, in that environment in a, in a real-time basis. So one thing I wanted to show you is that we've got a, a proposal actually under review right now where, in, in addition to, to building this platform, we're working with uh, a colleague over in the School of Public Health, Elv Arredondo, and Jenny Quintana, who's actually an exposure scientist uh, in, in environmental health over there, and John Elder, uh, who's a health behavior uh, uh, specialist, to look at uh, community action. There's this a call for proposals now about getting communities to, to better understand themselves what it is that's going on in their community. And this is in South Bay, San Diego, if you know our area, the San Ysidro community uh, approaching the Mexican border is heavily congested with traffic, with trucks, with problems, but it's also of a very high um, Latino community with lots of kids and lots of schools that are close to freeways and whatnot. So this project is really focusing on whether we can deploy a system like CitySense, and we're going to be, we're actually working with college students who grew up in, in San Ysidro, working with, with elementary school students in their science classes to get them to better understand what's going on with, with the air quality in their area and when it might be healthy for them to go outside and play and, and when it might not be. And then we're looking at different level influences on this from the individual to the school to the community, ultimately, we hope, influencing um, policy in terms of um, what it is that might happen, including policy with respect to how traffic is managed in, in that particular environment. So this is right now under under review with this uh, uh, this uh, uh, initiative. And we're really excited about this, as is the community, because it, it, it's really getting tools like this into the hands of communities is actually very, very exciting. <clears throat> and so putting all of this together, I'm going to my the final project I want to talk about is how do we how do we think about personal data, environmental data, and other kinds of data that we might have and, and, and think about bringing them together in a way that can help help um, accomplish uh, personalized population health. And so this is an NSF project that we started a couple of years ago. It's in the Smart and Connected Health portfolio. The National Science Foundation doesn't usually fund much in health, but over the last few years they have. And um, and the aim of this is actually summed up nicely in a, in a, in a GM up uh, in, in, uh, commentary that, that came up towards the end of last year. And it's this notion of, of models of data capture expanding from uh, across all levels, from genomic, molecular, cellular, organ level, et cetera. Electronic health records, of course, we know what's happened with electronic health records and, and uh, digitization of them. But at the same time, physical activity, lifestyle, socioeconomic, and environmental data are being captured. There are ongoing discussions about ways to harness this. So how do we, put, how do we bring all these things together? in some meaningful way. Well, there are two important trends, big data, big data approaches uh, that include personal health data, and then supercomputing, new tools to actually handle what you know, a decade ago was simply unthinkable in terms of, of, uh, of how, how one could, could do this. And leading the way, obviously, have not been those of us in health. It's been Google and Amazon and others that have set the stage for this. But, uh, but we have this terrific opportunity to take advantage of this. 
So again, many, many forms of data, genomic data, microbiome data, medical record data, personal health data, environmental data, uh, pollution and, and whatnot from devices like CitySense, and then public health and social determinants data. Uh, so again, how do we wrap our mind around actually getting a look at all of these data in ways that allow us to understand the relationships between and among uh, these? Providing healthcare and population health requires reasoning across these layers of data. I sort of like putting these in this sort of stack. Again, this is a, a, another way of looking at that other stack. And this notion of just simple things like managing diabetes. You know, you've got to know everything from, from what somebody's HbA1c might be from the medical records to are they getting enough physical activity. I mean, you know, why is their diabetes out of whack? And, and, well, maybe they were fully sedentary this last week. And then if you're managing their diabetes, do they have access to appropriate food? Um, asthma care of interest, obviously, to, to the community of us who are doing work in exposure and, and, uh, and, uh, and air quality. To really optimize asthma care, you've got to know about things across multiple levels of data. And even just something as simple as, as uh, tracking obesity for public health, it's not enough to just do periodic uh, self-report surveys or even look at medical records. You've got to look at a variety of things that can actually get a better understanding of what's happening, both at any point in time and across time. So most of these data are ignored or functionally unavailable because they're collected and maintained by different entities and different groups, you know, physical activity by one set of folks. Social interaction data, very, very important, collected by another set of folks. Weight data collected by others. Um, genomic data, how in the world do we think about putting this into, into the context of understanding epigenetic processes? Nutritional data, medical record data, and air quality data. Uh, so what's exciting is we're actually at a time when it's thinkable to, 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 to connect the dots between these forms of data. And so the vision of this project, when we pitched it, was that we would try and integrate these data into some sort of a single uniform database, implement analytics and visualization across the top of it, and I'll show that in here in a second, and then open this up, very importantly, open this up for other researchers, because we're also at a, at a time in history when, when we know that no one group and no group of groups is actually sufficient. There, there, there's just a terrific opportunity to crowdsource and to open things up and have, uh, have many, many people working on different aspects of the problem at the same time uh, to, to improve things. So what we've done here in San Diego is we're modeling how this might be done in a community like San Diego. Uh, and so we've pulled in partners, Qualcomm, our San Diego Association of Governments. We have uh, one of the health information exchanges here, the San Diego Health Connect. We actually have uh, one of the more successful uh, groups. It's not as successful as many of us would like, but it's uh, it's actually doing reasonably well connecting the various competitors in the healthcare environment and allowing sharing of health-related information that foreshadows what we might be able to do. And this is medical information with respect to registries of that information and potentially registries over time. <clears throat> and then we have a very proactive uh, public health department uh, that's, that's uh, uh, benefited from two or three CDC grants and, 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 and real visionary leadership to, to basically pull everyone together. And then connect. We, we we're connecting in with the entrepreneurial community. We've got a pretty pretty strong life sciences and bio life sciences community. And if we can get entrepreneurs to look at this issue, we think that that would be important. So the architecture for this project is, again, thinking of all these sources of data that we might have, bringing these data into uh, the, what we're calling a whole health information model. We're, we're modeling this uh, the, the way we might think about these data. And then importantly, as shown on the right side here, opening this up for three broad types of uses, uh, those individual kinds of uses that, that uh, individual, the patients or parents, you know, many of you have a health app on your phone or a fitness app or whatever. So you know, what if you wanted to localize some of those data uh, for your community in ways that could, could, could benefit others in your community? Um, medical personnel, so the whole notion of opening these data up for people in, in medical settings uh, who might want to use it. And then population health, so this would be public health personnel who might be interested in population st statistics and analytics. And so um, the modeling that we're doing on this project, we actually have more data scientists than we have health scientists. And these data scientists have done this kind of modeling work in marketing, in, uh, uh, in transportation, in other areas. And, and, and so we're, we're we're trying to uh, follow that lead and think about how we can model the data in ways that, that, that allow people to make sense of it. Have we, have we have an interface in the, in the platform that we're developing because sources of data change pretty quickly, so this allows new sources of data to be registered to this. And then we have this API, we call, we call this whole health 
application programming interface where we can open this up to, again, this ecosystem of people who might be wanting to access the data. <coughs> and then, importantly, both analytics and visualization. So the analytics, uh, again, will populate this with some analytical uh, uh, things that we develop, but we also want others to be adding in uh, things to this over time and sharing this through an open uh, uh, market so that they can, they can learn from it. And then, very importantly, visualization. Uh, when we have large amounts of data, sometimes the, the, the first and most important thing to do is just step back and take a look at it and, and, and generate some hypotheses from this to get a better understanding of what it might mean. So the research challenges on this are, 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 are many, and I don't have the time to dig into all of them, but, but they essentially sum into new data types um, and, and, again, highly different forms of, of of data uh, at, a, at a spatial level, at a temporal level, at a, just a, a tight level. I mean, it's very, very different dynamic environments. It's, you know, that train's left the station. There's lots that's going to continue to happen. We, we need to either address that or not. And then modeling this, again, very important, and you'll hear this from Jacqueline in her talk. Uh, again, a lot of what we work on is the fact that you've got to be thinking about how this is anchored into a particular location, and this is what's exciting about talking to people interested in the exposome, because place influences health. You've got to be doing this in ways to take into account um, uh, uh, local phenomena. So we've got two use cases that we're working on right now. Asthma is uh, is one, and obviously that's a logical extension of what we've, what we've done with the CitySense project, where we're uh, using data from um, sensors like uh, CitySense and uh, ca capturing environmental data and then medical record data to develop um, uh, improved abilities for people to understand uh, what's going on with their asthma. And we're actually uh, in partnership right now with uh, Kaiser, local Kaiser, to sort of explore what some of the requirements for this might be and developing an asthma app that could be used. And what we want to include in this are things that right now are really very difficult to include because, again, the data sources are not easily capturable and, 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 and to pull in. And, you know, everybody's heard about what Propeller Health has, has done and with, um, you know, GPS devices and asthma inhalers and whatnot. But that's, that's only part of the picture. I mean, the, the big part of the picture is giving real-time data to people, uh, combining things like their activity, what the local air quality might be in their particular neighborhood, what their medical record, what their, their individual medical characteristics might be. Are they on a medication or are they not? How are they responding to that? And so this um, this is something that we uh, that we're teasing out right now. And then our second use case is um, this is with some, uh, support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation on another project. We're working with the Virginia Commonwealth University Center for Society and Health on um, looking at how we can look at the entire community of San Diego with as many different kinds of data as we can. And here you see the structure of what we're looking at, socially and economic data, health systems data, the physical and social environment, public policies, and individual behaviors. And um, they've done some preliminary work across the state of California looking at, at, at life expectancy at the census tract level uh, using uh, both traditional techniques of, of, uh, of population epidemiological research, but then also some new methods of machine learning that can take into account many, many more variables than we might ordinarily, and really looking for both uh, uh, expected but then unexpected influences on health. And we're trying to replicate that in a more granular and more specific level here in San Diego. And, and again, what this does at, a, at the broadest level is allow us to take into account what this exposome is all about. And then we'll be looking at asthma, diabetes, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, et cetera. So essentially, we're, 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 we're trying to set up an environment where we can, we can step back and look at the big picture of, of uh, all influences on health because we think this is what policymakers want to know is like, where do we invest? Do we invest in safer sidewalks? Do we invest in medical care for things? Do we invest in immunization programs? What, what's, what's really the most important thing to put our resources in? And as I say in the final slide here, is importantly to do this in a way that, that, that demonstrates that this is possible to be done in a community the size of San Diego. Uh, we're already talking about replicating some of these in Virginia and other areas, but again, we think that San Diego is kind of, you know, not too hot, not too cold. It's sort of just the right size to sort of be able to do this, and, and, and in part because we have a variety of the data sources that are, that are pretty rich here locally. And we can also send out new kinds of things like CitySense and 
other things, and I think you'll hear uh, how Jacqueline's uh, very cool, how, how she's characterizing this as well. So with that, I will close. There's a view from the left coast, and I'll open it up to questions. So I'll, I'll get launched straight away into this uh, My Park study, and I think what you'll see, um, uh, Kevin was able to provide a very large, uh, big picture view of this, and I'll answer some very specific research questions in my presentation today. So I won't talk in too much detail about this My Park intervention, um, and it, you can look it up. There's a very nice video on YouTube, so if you typed M-I-P-A-R-C, into YouTube, you could see that video, including a perspective from our participants. But this is really one of the earlier um, trials, and now there's a, an, an NIH call for proposals to do more multi-level interventions. But this intervention was based in retirement communities, so we knew that we'd be able to um, expose our participants to the intervention that we were delivering because they lived in the location we were working. And if we influenced any of the neighborhood around those locations, again, they would be exposed to those. So this sort of uh, retirement community environment was like a microcosm for, for a larger community. And that's still the challenge. How do you take this type of intervention into uh, a much uh, broader community? But this is the first step for learning. And, and essentially, following the uh, ecological model, we were doing interventions at all different levels. So the, 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 the more novel and, and um, challenging intervention components were saying, OK, if you're um, walking, can we get you to walk further into your community? Now, these are older adults. The average age was 84. We had folks from 67 to over 100 years old. So of course, we. Um, start by encouraging them to walk indoors where it's safest, on their campus, depending on the campus side, size, where it also feels safe. But we want to um, give them that opportunity to walk in the neighborhood, and particularly for older adults, because purposeful walking is important. If they're able to walk to the grocery store and walk for transportation, that's extremely important to them. So um, we worked with a local um, uh, community advocacy agency, Walk San Diego, who are now called Circulate San Diego, um, and basically um, advocated around the intervention sites, first go out and do a, a walking audit and see what are the barriers to walking in these communities. Um, and on the top left, for example, you can see a very clear sidewalk. And that was only made possible because we put in the blocks to stop the cars going over the sidewalk. Originally, all the cars were, were um, blocking this sidewalk, and, and, and participants would not walk um, in this area, even though it provided access to, to great walking routes. Um, in another community, they didn't have a, 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 an auditory or a countdown signal for the crossing. It's a, it's a large road that, that, that is challenging to cross. We couldn't do much about the speed limit on that road or the, the width of the road, but suddenly the local transportation agency came in, immediately put in um, auditory and time down crossings. Um, and this was a key access point to a local um, shopping center. Um, and then the example, for example, on the, on the bridge here was that this bridge had been um, completely overgrown, full with trash, again, a key access point to um, a local shopping center. And otherwise, participants would have had to cross over roads, roads that sometimes didn't have uh, crosswalks or cross timing. So this bridge was a key access point. And it wasn't until the, the older adults advocated and got this um, it, uh, a letter on the mayor's desk, did they work out, okay, who is responsible for the maintenance of this bridge and, and then actually to get it cleaned? So the question is, if we're going to the effort to do these um, interventions and to try and encourage people to walk further and walk to different places, can we actually measure that? So these are the key exposome questions that I'll be talking to you about today. So one, our participants wore um, accelerometers and GPS in these studies. So the first question for me was, are our traditional accelerometer thresholds appropriate to identify walking in these older adults? As I say, average age 84, so um, older than many studies that have been uh, performed, and, and also in an um, intervention context. 
um, can we actually measure change in these participants with these tools? Um, and then can we assess if older adults changed where they walked because of our intervention? Um, and does where they walk impact their health in any way? So I'm going to start with the first one. So essentially, our participants do a 400-meter walking test as part of their um, functional fitness test. And during that test, we ask them to wear their accelerometers. And straight away from baseline data, um, as we started this study, we could see that depending on their age, the average um, counts that is normally a metric that you use in physical activity research vary greatly by the age group. So the three different colors are the three different age groups. Now, the black lines crossing those graphs, the, the around about the 2000 mark, is what we would use as a traditional accelerometer cut point to identify physical activity. So these people were performing their walk test. They're asked to walk as, as quickly and as comfortably as they can. We know they're walking. The behavior we're trying to encourage by this intervention, but the majority of participants were not walking at that level. Um, and I've also included a, a, a dotted line, which is an alternative cut point that, that has been proposed for older adults. And again, not appropriate for, for many of our over 90-year-olds. And when we then looked at these um, different uh, uh, amounts, that, that speed at which they walked during their 400-meter walking test, we then saw uh, applied those speeds and those, those um, kind of we calibrated this and made an individual cut point and then looked at them during their seven days of wear after this particular test. And particularly the younger folks, even though they could walk at this intensity during their 400 meter walk, um, they never reached that intensity when they were walking in free living. So this does not reflect what people are doing in their everyday lives. So that straight away alerted us to some issues. Um, so essentially, um, this is what then we, we, we used to try and develop training data to understand how we could use machine learning methods to better assess these, these um, accelerometer data. So rather than using a crude threshold, can we use more information from the accelerometer to um, actually inform what we're doing? And as accelerometers improved, raw data became available on three axes. It enabled those techniques to be used. But what's important for us is that um, we have some sort of ground truth to tell us what these participants are doing. And as I say, we don't want the ground truth to be a 400 meter walk that they're doing in a artificial setting. Um, we want the ground truth to be what they do in their everyday lives. So that's why we have this sense cam um, that's an outward facing camera and shows you um, what the participant is doing. So these are example images and we um, developed a coding system to be able to code what were the behaviors participants were doing. Um, and as you can see from the picture, uh, uh, the example sensors, um, we had um, sensors on the hip and wrist. The wrist accelerometer is now being used by NHANES, is able to capture 24 hours of data. Um, and as you can see, the, the sort of size and, and um, of the GPS data that, that, that we're using. And although some of these devices are now um, available in, in phones, particularly for our older adult population, we focused on these research grade devices that we should, could be sure captured um, the, the um, data we needed um, all the time. So essentially, um, these are the type of studies where we have this mode of mobile measurement of behaviors. The, the important part, part really is that we've been able to have um, diverse samples where these um, sense cams and, and the hip and wrist GPS, and that um, we have over 400 um, participants um, wearing these devices. We're still coding a lot of this data, um, um, but we'll have great training sets that, that hopefully, in my mind, we'll be able to develop an algorithm that is robust to, to cover many population groups. So obviously, coding this data is exceptionally time consuming by humans. Um, so we have also invested in, in um, machine learning techniques to help us better, um, more quickly identify um, what might be occurring in the image and then still having human coders to verify if that's the correct classification. 
So the machine learning technique we use um, is is basically comparing the the, the um, training the machine on the known truths that you have, and then testing the classification. And we create 41 features from um, the GPS and the accelerometer data, and then we use a random forest classifier as the, the first step in the machine learning process. Um, and then we basically also have a time smoothing using a, um, a Markov modeling, hidden Markov modeling as well. And these are the examples of the types of features that you that, that are important in the process. Um, and although the data I'm going to show you is just actually based on accelerometer outcomes, you can see that the GPS that's in green also contributes um, to, to us being able to better classify based behaviors. So the, the, the examples I'm actually going to show you, just to make the point about why it's so important to have free living data, we're actually comparing the performance of classifiers based on a study where we collected 500 different trips around San Diego um, to then two studies where we had cyclists and, and overweight females um, being, wearing these devices. So these were the first cohorts that wore the sense cam. And um, we now have data as well from the older adults um, that will enable us to apply these to them. But some of the points I want to make is um, when it's in free living, you don't necessarily have equal examples of all the behaviors you might be wanting to study. Um, so for example, when we did this prescribed particular transportation study, had a lot more riding in vehicle time, more um, walking time, um, and certainly in the cyclist cohort, we got some cycling, but in the overweight females, we didn't. And it's very important when you're developing a machine learning classifier, um, it benefits if there is a balance of behaviors, um, and, um, but the point is in free living, there isn't that balance of behaviors. So if it's, um, it, it's going to be more likely to um, predict a certain behavior based on the number of training examples you provide it. So as you can see, this is another uh, uh, box plot of the intensity of physical activity that occurred when we knew that these people were doing these particular behaviors, walking or running or cycling. So again, it just demonstrates to you how the um, existing cut point isn't functioning very well. Um, but importantly, the, the, the box plot on the um, far left of your screen is the, the folks that were um, asked to do these different transportation modes around the city and note what they were doing. So this is often what the other researchers are doing, is encouraging um, people to do these prescribed activities. Now, obviously, these, these researchers that did this had 500 trips to make, so they may have been motivated to walk a little bit more, bit, a bit faster to actually get these trips finished. So again, we don't really know what um, is occurring when we ask people not to do these things in that naturalistic settings. But again, you can see from the other points that in naturalistic settings, um, it's, it's definitely um, these cut points aren't, aren't uh, working. And you can see across the three different studies that had three different cohorts of people, very different levels of, of um, walking. And particularly here, the cycling is just totally missed by these cut points. And again, is cycling a relevant behavior? To me, yes, it, it, it really could be something that could contribute to public health if we could build better environments to support this. So our study essentially um, built this machine learned um, uh, algorithm, and then we tested it. So um, the first study, basically, when you have prescribed data, you can see that the algorithm performs very well for these different um, transportation modes, and you can get to up to 93% accuracy. Um, compared to when um, you develop a classifier in free living, perhaps you lose a, a few percent of accuracy, because again, it's, it's a much harder um, environment to predict in. But what's really important is when you um, use the classifier trained on the prescribed, so when you have study one training data prescribed to study three, the overweight women, it loses its accuracy by 13%. So essentially, something that's trained in a laboratory or trained in a, a false environment, it doesn't predict the free living behavior so well. And you can also even see that the cycling cohort did not look the same as the, the over 
weight obese women, and again, the classifier did not perform as well on these women. So um, this shows you in terms of type, the types of minutes that is um, predicted and, and, and mispredicted. And one of the things you can see is the cycling st cohort study two predicted cycling in these women, even though there was no cycling in these women. So again, if you train a classifier on a cohort where they cycle a lot, the classifier definitely is looking for that type of behavior to predict. So um, that's why it's so important to be having the right training data set. Um, and these algorithms work equally well whether you're using them on the, the hip or wrist. And again, they perform better than, than other um, algorithms developed in a laboratory setting. So the GGIR classifier was developed in a laboratory setting. So um, we're, we're more confident in these free living algorithms. So in terms of answering the exposone question, are traditional accelerometer thresholds appropriate for older adults? The answer is, is no, and machine learning techniques can improve our classification accuracy, but the training data really needs to be collected on the population of interest and in a free living context. So moving to the next exposome questions, can we assess um, if older adults changed where they walked and what's the impact on their health? Essentially, we're focusing on their GPS data to do this. So the first part of being able to analyze GPS data um, essentially came from um, a GEI, the Gene and Environment Initiative funded um, system called PALMS. Um, and now PALMS, uh, it's taken many years to develop, but it really is now being used by 147 different users around the world. Um, we have data on over 16,000 participants in this system and over 2.4 billion observations. Um, another important part of this process, this is all demonstrating it's a usable system, but are the algorithms and the, and the classifications we put into this system actually valid? So again, the, the prescribed trip study that we did was able to help us validate the mode, the indoor, outdoor, and the, and the length of the trip, but also our SEMSCAM data has been able to um, help us validate whether trips, in fact, are trips and the mode that they're um, occurring, whether it's indoor, outdoor time. And then we also even had in a preschool observations of indoor, outdoor time. So we have many papers now that, that are validating the algorithms within this system, and then over 30 papers of, of people using the system in their research. So again, to understand this GPS and accelerometer data, it wouldn't have been possible without um, investments in a system like this that helps us process and clean the data. So we've collected GPS data over a number of studies, in, including the MyPark intervention, and as I say, over multiple time points. Um, so again, what, what happens when you first look at the data? Well, um, there is missing data when you have GPS data, simply because there is signal interference. Other reasons for missing data are because, uh, fortunately, at the moment, you still have to charge your GPS data every night, whereas with the accelerometer, we can deploy that for nine days and not have any problems with, with battery life or, or memory. Um, so one of the first things we were looking at is, is can we um, – impute some of this missing data, and, and what is the implications if we do? So again, fantastic to have the SenseCam because it allowed us to say, okay, if we see a point, we lose data, and then we see a point, and it's very close to where the original data loss occurred, could we be confident that between those two time points, the person didn't actually change location? It's simply the building is interfering with the signal. And the SenseCam data was enabled us to, um, to confirm whether that was the case. And certainly in, in about 17% uh, of the cases, um, that was the case, and we were able to impute the data. But you can see from these graphs that there are very different patterns of, of data imputation depending on what, how much time the person is spending in these large buildings or, or um, sort of high-rise buildings where there might be more signal loss. So it matters, uh, it affects who has imputations, um, but also then if you're looking at sedentary behavior, you would lose a, a lot of knowledge about where that sedentary behavior occurred if you didn't impute 
some of these um, variables. So that certainly was an important first stage for us to understand what we're missing and what happens when we impute that data. And then we also had to um, develop um, a, a geo database to help us actually analyze the data. So, you know, previous studies had looked at perhaps single journeys in small um, numbers of participants, but when you actually want to know um, every point in time and exactly where it's occurring and what sort of locations it might be occurring in, it soon was really um, taxing the, the um, systems like ArcGIS. And instead, you have to create this separate geo database um, using Python and, and PostgreSQL to help this process happen more quickly. And so we invested in that. And in particular, a supercomputer center supported HIPAA compliant cloud so we could be confident that this GPS data was being stored and handled um, securely. So again, we were able to um, leverage funds from, from um, other grants to enable us to, to make this next step so that we could match GIS and, and GPS data. And then as we're doing all this work, we still need to understand what it is we're looking at. And, and, and so a framework was something we definitely had to develop and, and have more theoretical understanding of what it was we were looking at. And in particular, what is exposure? Because that's what we're now starting to look at. So is exposure to do with time, in particular something like time domains? And I'll show you an example of a time domain with this life space idea. Or is it do, to do with location? And then what is actually location, or, or is it to do with behaviors? And as we um, move and, and start to understand that our traditional studies um, have really been about access, when you look at somebody's neighborhood and say what's around them and does that influence their behavior, that is to do with access. And even if you use your GPS data and cre create something like an activity space or a, a standard deviation, a list, um, that's still not exactly where you're going. So what we're trying to get to now is, is looking at how we can use kernel buffers that might be weighted for the, the speed or the transportation mode and actually get at, at measures of exposure. And again, as we do that, and we're talking about every single data point, um, it has great implications for our statistics as well because we're looking now at, at three levels of nesting, which is minutes within days and, and days within in people. So um, it's definitely been challenging from that perspective as well. So here's an example if you think about locations. So when, when the Palm system picks at locations, you can see along the, the pink dots that are a GPS trace, there are, there are three um, green dots here. So this is how Palms would cluster um, and say this is a location. And our SenseCam provides us images of what those locations are. So they're periods in time, say 20 minutes or so, when someone has clearly stopped and is, is, is taking a break, and that would be considered a location. There's also another system you, you can use, which, which is a kernel um, uh, density that looks at locations. And this seems to have much smaller periods of time, but also perhaps still meaningful places. And then another way of thinking about locations is with an amoeba approach. And that basically says that this whole hiking trip is a location. So if you think about it, if we're thinking about walking in the community, is something like Chinatown a destination and a location? It's not a single point. It's a whole area. Um, so that's even sort of shown some of the challenges of simply trying to define something like location. It really depends on your research question. So what we look at in our older adults is these life spaces. And people have shown that self-reported life space, so for example, do you leave your bedroom? Do you leave your house? Do you leave your porch? Do you leave your garden? Do you leave your neighborhood? That those things are related to mortality and cognition. So what we can do in our older adults in these retirement communities is look at the percent of time at home, on campus, in the neighborhood, and beyond the neighborhood. Um, and then we can also see the percent time walking in those domains. So this is a way of us being able to aggregate this data across the whole group and, for example, compare control and intervention groups. Um, other questions that we're looking at 
is comes down more into the individual level. So, for example, here you can see where a participant walked in the red at baseline and then where they walked in the green um, after they followed some of the map routes we had. Now, this is still at the individual level, um, and so our challenge is how can we um, have metrics of this um, across the whole sample? Um, and then also here, this is an example where you could see a change in, in the walking um, due to installation of a safer crosswalk. Just going to pause here and maybe show some animations if we have time. Yeah, okay. So again, these, these animations are, are, not show, are showing aggregate data, which is important, um, but they're, they're not um, necessarily giving a statistical metric. So what you can see here is uh, the, the blue line identifies the, the campus of this retirement community which, as you can see, beautiful location and a very um, walkable neighborhood. But there's really not much activity. The orange dots are when activity occurs. Um, that's higher intensity. The, the yellow dots are probably walking speed in older adults. And even despite the walkable community, at baseline, there's not much physical activity occurring. And, and these retirement communities um, are also um, well resourced with, with physical activity resources. So let's go to the next um, animation, which is at the, the three-month time point. And as I say, although this isn't um, statistical metrics that we can report on yet, these types of animations, I think, are very important for policymakers um, to be able to see, because I think these types of animations are motivating. So here you can now see that our participants are taking walks that are of a decent intensity and walking out into the community and using their community more. So although, as I say, I'm still trying to say how can I capture this statistically so that it's, it, it, I can show that there's a, a significant spatial and physical activity difference, um, it, it's very apparent visually, and if I was talking to my policymakers down at Sandag, who I, who I meet with regularly, I would use an animation like this to, to make that point more clearly than perhaps any of my um, p-values could demonstrate. So uh, we're, we're really excited to have this capacity and, and, and to see this. So we can now go back to the presentation. Thank you, Kevin. So essentially, answering this question, can we assess if older adults change where they walked because of eye intervention? Yes, I, I feel like the GPS do have the accuracy these days to be able to help us do that, but the data preparation and the analysis is still challenging. Um, so the next question is, does where they walk impact their health? So this is one analysis, again, we've only done it at baseline at the moment, but essentially, we grouped people into whether they, in the black um, bars, whether they spent less than 30 minutes outdoors and whether they had 30 minutes of physical activity in the day. And going through to those that had some activity but not outdoors or just some outdoor time but no physical activity to the, to the group in the white bars who are those that basically did both. They spent more than 30 minutes outdoors and they had 30 minutes of activity in a day. And essentially, you can see across these different variables, fear of falling, trail speed is a, a cognitive functioning test. Again, their 400-meter walk time or the self-reported functioning where, where higher scores are, are better and the other ones, lower scores are better. So you can really see this difference between the, the, the groups that um, those that are indoors doing no physical activity um, are definitely not doing as well as those who are outdoors and doing physical activity. And, you know, when um, these type of uh, studies are, are covered in the press, I, I get a lot of older adults calling me and saying, you know, um, can, we, can we show that our hiking group is doing better or people saying, I do indoors, should I be going outdoors? To me, my first message is always, always about safety. And again, if we can demonstrate that the outdoor activity does have some benefits, then I think that would be really important for policymakers to make those outdoor environments safe. Um, so until we have a randomized controlled trial actually testing this, you know, I'm very careful about what I claim here. 
But I think there are also new um, uh, thoughts that we can think about. So when our, 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 a new colleague here, Rob Knight, came to UCSD, he was very interested in the fact that we could capture indoor-outdoor time across populations. And um, this basically can be related to the gut microbiome. So um, going forward, thinking about ways of, of including those sorts of um, data in our analyses. So that takes me to then um, uh, the next study that, that we had funded from NCI, which is really trying to um, capture both the home environment through traditional GIS, but also then our exposure environment through GPS, that this is getting from a cohort in San Diego, half of them Hispanic, but we're really getting that variation in environment from the start, from, from where they live, and we're taking it through to being able to have blood biomarkers of, of insulin resistance and information. So there are very few um, neighborhood studies that, that have these types of um, biomarker outcomes, and when they are there, they're about the neighborhood, not about total exposure. So this study is, is crossing the range from 35 to um, 80, 85-year-olds. Um, and so what's also then we've been able to leverage from this data set is in a small sample, they will be wearing the SenseCam again to help validate the algorithms we'll be applying to this population to get more detail about context. We're going to have um, a, a small sample also having the phone um, and including audio in that because our machine learned um, uh, colleagues are very interested in that. Um, but as, as Kevin said, we're bringing in the genome and the microbiome as well, um, and, and we're really excited that this will be small, but one of the first data sets that's actually able to look at, at many more layers of this um, issue that, than in the past. So just to finish, I've been focusing mostly on, on physical activity and space, but um, I, I would be amiss if I didn't remind you of the media attention that has been um, uh, attributed to sitting. And again, um, there are good ways now with these thigh-worn um, inclinometers to measure sitting behaviors, and we've done several studies looking at this. So um, for me, I think it really just takes us back to the public health picture, which is we need better measurement of the 24-hour day. Um, I want to be able to see um, where and when behaviors occur um, and how they might be interrelated. So, for example, time of day and location of walking, for example, how is that related to, to sleep? I'm really looking to see if we can increase the piece of the pie that is exercise and reduce the piece of the pie that, that is sitting. Um, and so it's important we, we get these 24 hours of the day. So that's me. Thank you.